Hello again. So this video is all about cash control systems, and there are lots of topics. So we're going to talk about checking accounts, endorsements, dishonored checks, debit cards and EFTs, check stubs, statement reconciliation, and petty cash. So let's start off with page number one and checking accounts. So what account do we use the most? Which account so far in accounting has the most entries? The answer to that is cash. And in accounting, liquid money is referred to as cash. And most businesses keep the majority of its money in the bank and make major cash payments by check, debit card, or EFP, which stands for electronic funds payment. Now we'll talk about these in more detail in upcoming pages, but when we say cash, remember it is not a stack of money sitting on the business owner's desk or even in a safe in the business. It is the cash account, meaning the checking account in the bank. The reason that most businesses do this is it provides evidence to support accounting records. So records can be confirmed with the bank and it's just another backup to support that whatever the accountant and whatever the business is saying is true to what's going on with cash. Code of conduct is a vocab word in this chapter. It means a statement that guides the ethical behavior of a company and its employees. Why do you think that this vocab word is included when talking about cash? Well, it's because often unethical behavior in business is surrounding money. And so code of conduct is an appropriate vocabulary word to have in our chapter about cash. Okay, checking account is defined as a bank account from which payments can be ordered by a depositor. A deposit slip is prepared when a customer places currency and or checks into a bank account. And you can see an example of one here. And once that's done, a receipt is given to the depositor when a deposit is made. So it's a little paper from the bank that says this is how much was deposited at this time and gives more details. On the bottom of a deposit slip, there's a routing number. It is a nine-digit number that identifies the bank, routing, and account numbers. They're on deposit slips as well as checks. Again, it's another way to follow the paper trail and to keep track of where it's going to and where it's coming from. Lastly, a check is defined as a business form ordering a bank to pay cash from a bank account. As a side note about page one, you do not journalize a deposit. The reason you don't need to journalize a deposit is because that transaction was already journalized when money was received. And so you don't want to do it again because you would be double recording that one transaction. So journalizing deposits is not necessary. Okay, moving on to page two, we're going to talk about endorsements. And an endorsement is defined as a signature or stamp on the back of a check that transfers ownership. So if somebody writes a check to you, you need to sign the back of it before you take it to the bank to deposit it or to cash it. When you sign it, it should be signed exactly as the name appears on the front. And once it's endorsed, anyone can take it to the bank and cash it. So you don't want to sign the back of a check until you're at the bank. That way it ensures that if you lose it, that somebody else can't get that money. The first kind of endorsement is called a blank endorsement, and that's just signing it. Someone writes you a check, you sign your name on the back, you take it to the bank and cash or deposit it. The next kind of endorsement is called a special endorsement. If a check is written to you, you can give that money to someone else without having to turn it into cash first. For example, if you get a $50 check and you want to give that $50 check to someone else, you want to pay that $50 to someone else, you would write the words, pay to the order of, you would write that person's name that you want to give it to, and then you would sign your name. Now, this check was written to Deona, but Deona wants to give it to Landscaper. So that's what this special endorsement is all about. And our third type of endorsement is called a restrictive endorsement. This restricts further transfer of ownership. So businesses often have this as a stamp and they use it right when checks are received so that no one else can deposit this money or no one else can transfer ownership any further. So it's commonly used with online banking as well. And what this endorsement needs to say is for deposit only to the account of example business and then Deona goes ahead and signs it but the for deposit only that's restricting it to the account that you list there 
Okay, so transaction number five. On April 15th, we paid cash on account to vendor for $500. For every check that is written, the business records and keeps a check stub as the source document for the transaction. It is always about the paper trail. We need a source document to prove where our money's coming from and where it's going to. So whenever you write a check, the source document is a check stub. And it includes the same information that is on the check. So we've got the amount for $500, The date is April 15th. It is two vendor. It's four supplies. The balance brought forward is the amount that is in our account before we write this check. Amount this check is the $500 again to show how much this check is worth. And then our balance carried forward is how much money we will have in our account after this check is taken out. So 1100 minus 500 is 600. So that's the balance that's carried forward from here. Now, this is what we keep. What we give to vendor has very much the same information. We've got the date. It's to vendor. We've got the amount written in numbers, the amount written in words with the squiggly line so that no one can alter or it makes it harder for somebody to alter the check and add numbers there. Again, it's four supplies and then Diona signs it. So this is the part that we give to vendor. The check stub is the part that we keep for our records. Moving on to page three, we're gonna talk about dishonored checks. So banks usually refuse to accept altered checks. If an error is made, you need to write the word void on the check and on the check stub. So for example, if we meant to write this out to vendor, but we accidentally wrote landscaper, We cannot cross it out and write vendor. That's considered an altered check and the bank would say, sorry, can't accept this because there's an alteration on it and we don't know if it was okayed by Diona or not. So you write the word void across it like that and then you keep it for records and journalize the voided check. The reason you journalize this, even though nothing's going on with the actual money, is that checks are pre-numbered and there should not be a question as to where the voided check went. For example, you would write the date, the 15th, you would write the word void in the account title column, then you would write the check number C3 and it's not going anywhere. So you're just going to put a check mark in the post ref column because we're not gonna post this to the ledger. And then you draw lines through the debit and credit columns to show that nothing's going on with the money. The sole purpose for doing this is to record C3 so that in your journal, you'll still have C1, C2, C3, C4. C3, nothing happened, it was voided, but there's no question about where that money went or where that check went because it is included in your journal. Okay, so a dishonored check then is defined as a check that a bank refuses to pay. And a bank might refuse to pay a dishonored check for a number of reasons. One reason is that there may be insufficient funds. If we write this $500 check, but we only have $100 in our account, the bank may refuse to pay that. If we alter the check, like I said above, if we accidentally wrote it to landscaper, but it meant to be to vendor and we alter it, they won't accept it or they often won't accept it because there could be a question about whether or not it was allowed to be changed or if the person that had the authority to change it was the one that did. They may not honor a check if the signature doesn't match. By the way, these three are illegal. You are not allowed to write checks if you don't have that amount of money in the account. Sometimes people do this on accident and, you know, no big deal, whatever, you talk to your bank. But if this is something that's done purposely and often, then that's illegal. An altered check, you cannot alter a check if you are not the person that's written the check in the first place. And again, banks may not accept them anyway. That's why you void it. If the signature doesn't match, like you can't take your parents' checkbook and sign it. That's illegal to do. You can't act as if you are someone else and sign it for them. No can do. Those are all illegal. Another reason why a bank might not accept a check or might not honor a check is if the words and numbers don't match. So up at the top, we have $500 in numbers and then we wrote 500 and 00 over 100 for our cents those match if words and numbers don't match a bank won't honor it because they don't know which one to go with if a check is post dated it may be dishonored that means if today is september 1st and the check is written for september 3rd 
you can't take it to the bank September 1st or September 2nd. You have to wait till September 3rd or it might be dishonored. Also, if a stop payment is made, it will be dishonored. That means if Deona wrote the check and then called the bank and said, I no longer want this check to go through, then it will stop the check and vendor cannot go ahead and cash or deposit it because a stop payment was made. All right, looking at this example, why was this check dishonored? Look at the reasons that a bank may refuse to pay the check. The answer to this is because the numbers and the words don't match. So 700, 1700, those don't match. The bank would not honor this check because they wouldn't know how much B. Osman, aka Bossman, wanted, wanted to write that amount for. So dishonored checks often become a loss. Most banks will charge a fee for handling them, and sometimes you can collect both the check amount and the fee amount from the person who wrote the check, but oftentimes it just ends up becoming a loss. So this is how we would journalize a dishonored check. First, we have to think about which accounts are affected. Well, cash is impacted, and then also the accounts receivable account, because if CB was going to pay us money, but then their check was dishonored and it didn't go through. When we received the check, we recorded it as their bill going down and our cash going up. But now our cash has to be taken back down and their bill has to go back up. So what does this mean? Well, when we received the cash, it was a debit. When it's dishonored and it turns out we are no longer receiving that cash, then it has to be credited to take that cash out because we never actually got it. Again, their bill, when we received it, we recorded it as a credit because it was their bill. It was an asset that was decreasing. But once it's dishonored, their bill goes back up because it, in fact, was not paid. And so this is how we journalize it. If we're journalizing a $700 dishonored check with a $30 bank fee, because often banks will charge a fee for handling those checks. So we start with our date if it's the 31st then accounts receivable CB, remember their bill goes back up. So it's an asset. It's going to be a debit, $730. That's because they owed us $700. That's what they wrote the check for. And then the bank also charged us $30 for that dishonored check. So then we are going to bill them that extra $30 in hopes that they end up paying us for the fee because their check was dishonored. So the total then is the amount of the check plus that bank fee. So it's $730. And then our cash goes down $730. We never saw that $700. That was never in our account, but we recorded it as if we did have it because we got a check for it. And then once it was dishonored, realized we in fact didn't get that. So the $700 is taken back out of our cash records and then the $30 as well because we did have to pay that to the bank that was taken out of our account. So the source document is a memorandum. This happens to be M9, and a memorandum is written when there's not another source document to start the paper trail. So it's memorandum for dishonored checks. Page four talks about debit cards and EFTs, also known as electronic funds transfers. A debit card is defined as a bank card that automatically deducts the amount of a purchase from the checking account of the cardholder. It eliminates writing a check, but using it's essentially the same thing. Do you know how a debit card is different than, that should say than, than a credit card? A debit card comes right out of a checking account, whereas a credit card is a bill that you get and have to pay later. So debit cards, you have to have money in your account to make a payment with a debit card. A credit card, on the other hand, you pay later. Okay, transaction number two. If it were made by a debit card instead of by a check. So on April 2nd, if we paid cash for supplies for $300, this is how it would look. It would still be April 2nd. Supplies would still be going up. It would still be $300 in the debit column. Cash would still be the credit. $300 would still be in the credit column there. However, instead of a check, it would now be a memorandum. So if payments are made by debit card, the source document is a memorandum. So M1 is represented there. It's very similar to writing a check. It's just a different source document. Alrighty, so we've got our little dinosaur here because 
Are checks going to be extinct? We've got our futuristic astronaut guy saying, bye, checks. <laughs> so when checks are not used, something called electronic funds transfer is used. It is defined as a computerized cash payment system that transfers funds without the use of checks, currency, or other paper documents, also known as EFT. So many businesses use this to pay vendors, and arrangements are made through the banks of both parties. If you work at a job and get your paycheck via direct deposit, that is an electronic funds transfer. It used to be that all employers paid their employees by either giving them cash or writing them a check for each payday. And now it's very common for direct deposits, which is a form of EFT. Okay, number five, if transaction number five were made by EFT instead of by check. So April 15th, paid cash on account to vendor for $500, it would look like this. The date is the same. The accounts payable to vendor is decreasing because we're paying them and that's a liability. So that's gonna be a debit when it decreases. The debit is still $500. The credit is still cash because our cash is going down. We're paying cash. The credit, again, is still $500. But again, this is a memorandum to show the electronic funds transfer similar to a debit card. It's not a check stub. It is a memorandum that starts that paper trail. Our next page is going over bank statement reconciliation. So a bank statement is defined as a report of deposits, withdrawals, service charges, and bank balances sent to a depositor, that should say sent, <laughs> sent to a depositor by a bank. Here is an example of our bank statement. And banks rarely make mistakes, but it's possible. Just like I rarely make mistakes, but it is possible. Just like I wrote set instead of sent. Make sure you write sent when you write it in yours. But banks rarely make mistakes, but it is possible. So you want to check their records and notify them as soon as possible. So four reasons that your business records might not match the bank's records. One is that you may not have recorded a service charge. So banks sometimes take out service charges and that's something that's easy to miss by a business. And so it might be off because of that service charge, which means you need to update your business records to show that there was a service charge from the bank and you have less money in your bank account because of that charge. Two, it could be a math error. Math errors happen. People make mistakes. Accounting is done by people. So it could be a math error. Another reason, it could be an outstanding deposit or an outstanding check. Outstanding means it was done, but it's not showing on the bank statement yet. So outstanding, we'll talk more about that down at the bottom of this one. Reconciliation of a bank statement. This is done to verify info on the statement that it is in agreement with your business record. So here's how we do it. We start out with the date. It's the date that you are doing the reconciliation, not the date on the bank statement. It's the date you're doing the reconciliation. Sometimes they're the same, not always. Starting on the left, the balance on check stub number five is $500. There was a service charge. You can see the service charge on our bank statement there for $5. And sometimes there's other stuff going on here too. So sometimes you need to total it. If it's just one, of course, you just move the total bank charge down. So it's $5. And then a bank charge, think about what's happening. Is that increasing or decreasing your account balance? Well, it's decreasing it. So you take your check stub balance minus the service charge. And in this case, we get $495. So now our records are up to date with what the bank did. Now we're going to update the bank with what we did. So you start by taking the balance on the bank statement. And then in this case, our balance is $695. Then you add any outstanding deposits. So in this case, on April 26th, we deposited $300, but it was not yet recorded in the bank. So if there's more than one, you total them up. If there's not more than one, you just drop that number down. So our total outstanding deposits are $300. And so we take the statement plus the deposits because when we deposit money, our bank balance goes up. So the statement balance plus the outstanding deposit, our subtotal here is $995. 
And then we record any outstanding checks. So did we write any checks that are not showing up on this bank statement? In this case, we wrote a check on check number three. You'll see in the bank statement, the check column in the middle there, we have check one, two, four, and five. Check number three was not recorded here. So that means that we wrote the check, we gave it to somebody to pay them, and they did not yet cash or deposit it, which means it didn't come out of our bank yet. Again, if there's more than one, you total them up and put them on the total line there, but it's just one, so we move that 500 down, and now that check is going to decrease our account balance. So the 995 minus 500 equals 495, and you need these numbers at the bottom to match. That's the reconciliation part. Page six has more about check stubs. So in these scenarios, the account balance increases or decreases even though a check is not written. To keep our business records up to date, they are recorded on the check stubs. So when we deposit cash from sales, let's just say our balance brought forward is $600. We're making a deposit on April 15th of $300. That's money we got from sales. We need to record our subtotal there to show that our account balance increased before we would write more on this check stub once we write the check. Now remember that when we receive the cash from sales, that is when we journalize it. So when we're depositing it, we don't want to journalize it again because that would look like we made $600 instead of $300. So when you are depositing money, you don't need to journalize because the transaction was already journalized. Moving on, it says because a check is not written, a memorandum is prepared for each of the following scenarios. Remember, the memorandum is a catch-all. If there's not another source document, such as a check stub, then you write a memorandum. If the purchase of supplies in transaction number two was made by debit card instead of by check, we need to make sure our business records reflect that, so we record it on the check stub. If our balance brought forward is $2,000 and there's not a deposit going on at this time, we just drop down our subtotal. Then in the other section, we record the debit card payment of $300. And then our subtotal would be that $2,000 minus the $300 because when we make a payment, when we use our debit card, money is coming out of our account. So our subtotal is $1,700. And then when we go ahead and write the check, we would write amount this check. And then the balance carried forward would be the check subtracted from that $1,700 or that $1,700. Electronic funds transfers, also known as EFTs, and dishonored checks are also recorded in the other section of the check stub. So if we're recording a bank service charge, it would look like this. We've got our balance carried forward. Nothing's being deposited, so it's just 500 in that subtotal. We write service charge of $5. Then the subtotal, that would take that money out. So we take the $500 balance minus $5. Our subtotal here is $495. The service charge is relatively small and doesn't happen very often, so it's recorded using the miscellaneous expense account. And we do need to journalize this. So here's how we would journalize a bank service charge. And remember, journal entries need to be made for any scenario in which one was not already done. So up at the top of this, depositing cash from sales, the transaction was already journalized when we received that cash. The bank service charge was not yet journalized, so we need to do that. We record our date of April 30th, just the 30th, because it's not the first line in the journal. Miscellaneous expense is going to be the debit because the business is frowning and expenses fall under owner's equity. So when the business is frowning, it's a debit to owner's equity accounts. Cash is what's decreasing. It's an asset that's going down. And then our source document is a memorandum. It's M4. Our last page, page seven, is all about petty cash. Petty cash is defined as a cash fund kept at the place of business from which small cash payments can be made. Now, petty cash is something of value to us, so it is an asset. And we know that the normal balance side of all asset accounts is debit. Credit is the side that's decreasing for our asset account. When you establish a petty cash fund, this is how it's journalized. You include your date. Petty cash is what's increasing. Our asset is going up, so it's a debit. Say it's $100. Cash is what's going down because you're taking money out of your cash account and putting it into your petty cash account. So again, the credit matches, it's $100.
Our source document is a check. And in this case, our example is just check number 372. That $100 amount is chosen by the business. If the business wants to put $100 in or $200 in or $300 in, that's up to the business. A check is written for the amount and then cashed. So money is put in a locked petty cash box at the business and only authorized employees can access it. At my first job, it was a locked drawer in the manager's office. It can be a safe, it can be a locked drawer, it can be a locked cash box, it can be whatever the business decides. A petty cash slip is defined as a form showing proof of petty cash payment. It is prepared every time petty cash is used, and those petty cash slips are kept in the petty cash box until the fund is replenished. Now, journal entries are not made until the fund is replenished. So you make a journal entry to establish the fund in the first place, the first time you ever make a petty cash fund. And then each time you replenish the petty cash box and petty cash fund, then you journalize the transactions for all those slips that are in the petty cash box. Petty cash slips look like this. You include the date, the amount, who it's paid to, what it's paid for, which account you're going to charge it to, and then it's signed by the person who has authority to do that. In this case, it's Deona. Here's another example. We've got our date, an amount, who it's paid to, what it's for, which account you're going to record it in, and who it's approved by or the signature of the person who approved it. So in August, we made these two small payments using our petty cash money. And now at the end of the month, we're going to replenish the petty cash fund. So this is how we journalize that transaction. We have August 31st as our date. We are going to debit advertising expense for $10. We're going to debit postage expense for $9. Now notice we have two debited accounts. Both of those cause cash to go down. So our credit amount is the total of those two debits. So our cash is $19, and that is 10 plus 9 is 19. And so you can have more than one account debited or more than one account credited. You just have the matching debit or credit be the same amount. So in this example, this is the first time we've had two debited accounts, but our debits still match our credits, and that's what's most important here. The document number is listed as C396, that means check number 396, and that's what we're using to put that $19 back into our petty cash box. There we go. Those are our cash control systems notes. We've gone over checking accounts, endorsements, dishonored checks. We've talked about debit cards and electronic funds transfers. We've talked about bank statement reconciliation, check stubs, and petty cash. So I hope you found these notes helpful. At this point, you can go back and add color or different notes in the margins. I hope you found this helpful and thanks for watching.